Wind turbines are big and getting bigger. The largest wind turbines now have towers that are over 150 meters tall and blades that are well over 100 meters long. But how big can they get? And how big will they get? In this video, I'm going to talk about the engineering behind this that helps designers decide how big wind turbines should be. I'll briefly cover some overall scaling effects and then go into a bit more depth about the structural design of the most important components. After that, we'll talk about how engineers trade off the different scaling effects of each of the components to end up with the lowest cost of energy overall. Engineers call these multi-factor trade-offs multidisciplinary design optimization, but I prefer to call it a game of tug of war. On one side of the rope, we have all the factors that make wind energy cheaper as turbines get bigger. And on the other side of the rope, we have structural design factors that actually favor wind turbines staying small. I'm Rosie Vance, welcome to Engineering with Rosie. For the past decade, I've worked mostly in the wind industry. In 2012, I went back to uni to do a PhD on structural design of wind turbine blades. And then I moved to Denmark to work for a Danish wind turbine manufacturer for nearly five years after that. These days I run a small consulting company and spend roughly half my time on wind energy projects. So when I lived in Denmark, I learned that one of the fun cultural things about Danes is that they will take any excuse to celebrate with a cake. When it's your birthday, you need to bring a cake into the office. If a project's completed, the project manager needs to arrange a cake. A new car? Cake. Someone's horse had a foal? Yep, that's a cake occasion too. But for the really big events, the company will buy the cake. For a 10 year or 25 year work anniversary, staff will gather in the canteen eating company sponsored cake and the employee being celebrated will give a speech. And at the wind energy company that I worked for, that speech always followed the same pattern. Something along the lines of, when I started here in 1995, wind turbines were 12 meters long and that seemed pretty long and we all wondered how long can they get? We agreed 20 meters was about the maximum possible. And everyone would laugh because by now wind turbine blades are over 100 meters long and still growing. So I wonder how much longer can they get? In 25 years, will today's graduate engineers be laughing at our puny 100 meter long blades because by then they're a kilometer long? That would be like a gigawatt size wind turbine. It sounds totally ridiculous. But then it sounds equally ridiculous to imagine that after decades of fairly constant growth that at some point it would just stop. I think a useful way to look at this issue is to start by asking two questions. One, why have wind turbines gotten as big as they have? And two, what's stopping them from getting even bigger? And in my mind, those two questions form competing teams on a tug of war. On the side of wind turbines getting bigger, if we have larger wind turbines, they generate more power, they have fewer electrical connections, and in many ways it's simpler and cheaper to install and maintain a wind farm of say 10 5 megawatt wind turbines than 51 megawatt turbines. Furthermore, as turbines get bigger, the hub heights increase and since wind speeds increase as you get away from the ground due to a phenomenon called wind shear, larger turbines have access to a better wind resource. But a larger wind turbine means longer blades, a bigger generator, a larger foundation, probably a taller tower. For most of these components, structural design factors actually favor staying smaller. The reason for this can best be described using the square cube law. This principle was known as far back as Galileo, who used it in 1638 to explain why objects can't be just any arbitrary size. When you multiply the size of an object, its area increases by the square of the multiplier, whereas its volume increases by the cube of the multiplier. To understand why that matters, think of an athlete in a sport where strength and weight both matter. Say gymnastics or my old sport, cross country mountain biking. And compare a tall and a short athlete with otherwise similar proportions. An athlete's strength depends on the cross-sectional area of their muscles, which tends to increase with the square of their height, but their weight depends largely on the volume on the muscles, which increases with the cube of their height. So when weight matters, like when you're doing a flip or when you're riding a bike up a steep hill, a tall athlete is at a disadvantage. This is why gymnasts and cross-country mountain bikers are usually very small people and one of the reasons why I, at 181 centimetres tall, did not have a long and successful career as a professional cross-country mountain bike racer. To bring the concept back to wind turbines, the power a wind turbine can generate scales with the square of the blade length, but the volume and mass scale with the cube, and so does the cost of many components. The whole crux of the issue is that scaling is different if you're working in two dimensions versus three dimensions. 
This video is sponsored by Brilliant, and they have a lesson that introduces this concept using interactive examples. Brilliant is a website and app with over 60 interactive courses in math, science, and related topics like engineering. In addition to the lesson on scaling, Brilliant also has a whole course on the maths you need, including a lesson on powers and square roots. The interactive examples are one of my favorite things about Brilliant. You learn by doing, not just memorizing, and then you apply the concepts to everyday examples. This helps you develop an intuitive understanding of the concepts. You can get started on Brilliant for free, and for Engineering with Rosie viewers, Brilliant is offering 20% off an annual subscription for the first 200 viewers to sign up. You just need to go to brilliant.org slash engineeringwithrosie. I'll put the link in the description. So to summarize before we move on, larger wind turbines mean more power with fewer machines, whereas smaller wind turbines means less materials overall. But perhaps you feel I've missed the main point. Is small or big better at capturing energy from the wind and converting it to electricity, which is more aerodynamically efficient? The answer to this question is, is probably kind of disappointing. I'm, I'm sorry. There actually isn't a significant scaling effect there. The maximum amount of energy that a horizontal axis wind turbine can extract from the wind is about 59%. One of my early videos is on that topic, so you can check that out if you want all the details why. But that maximum efficiency does not change as wind turbines get bigger or smaller. There are some aspects that indirectly affect efficiency as the scale changes, so it's not 100% accurate to say that scale doesn't affect aerodynamic efficiency at all, but none of these are very significant compared to the structural effects and other costs like installation and maintenance that we're going to talk about in this video. So let's take a closer look at this game of tug of war. As I already mentioned, we have some effects that favor wind turbines getting bigger and bigger and some effects that favor wind turbines staying small. We'll call these team big on one side of the rope and team small on the other side. And though there are a lot of components in a wind turbine and a lot of other costs, we're just going to focus on the main ones here. That's the most expensive turbine components, the rotor, tower and drivetrain assembly, and the main non-turbine costs, operation and maintenance and balance of system, which is basically everything that a wind farm needs aside from the turbines themselves. So what is on team big and team small and who is going to win? On team big, we have the factors I mentioned at the start. Larger wind turbines reach faster winds, their blades sweep a greater area, so they generate more power. They have fewer electrical connections, require less maintenance visits, and are simpler to install as long as you can get cranes and or ships big enough to install them. There are also a lot of components that you need one off per turbine whose cost doesn't really increase for a larger turbine. The turbine controller is an example of one of those. The cost of everything on team big increases more slowly than power output as turbine sizes increase, which helps make cheaper energy as wind turbines get bigger. Next, we have all the stuff whose cost increases at the same rate as power increases. So these two effects cancel each other out and you end up without much change in the cost of energy from these components as you increase turbine size. Let's call these components the audience for the tug of war because they don't really affect the outcome. These components include the generator, nacelle, grid connection and electronics. Then over on Team Small is where things get interesting. Here we have a bunch of components that get more expensive faster than power input increases as turbines get bigger. The main components like this are the blades, the tower, and the gearbox and main bearings. To see why, let's learn a little bit about structural design and classical beam theory specifically. A wind turbine blade or a tower are essentially cantilever beams with one end fixed and the other free. This formula describes the stress at the support of a cantilever beam with a concentrated load at its tip. Stress is force divided by area and if you want your structure not to break, then you need to keep the maximum stress below the breaking point, the yield stress of the material that you're using. I is the area moment of inertia, which is a geometric property that indicates resistance to deflection. For a tubular section, I is calculated using this formula. So now let's see what happens if we double all the dimensions of our tubular wind turbine. Doubling the blade length means quadrupling the power and all the aerodynamic forces along with it. But because we increase the diameter of the tube and its thickness, the maximum stress actually stays exactly the same. Now onto stiffness, which is also an important constraint for wind turbine blades and towers. This equation describes the deflection of a tubular beam with a concentrated load at its tip. E is the modulus of elasticity, which is a property of the material used to make the beam, the stiffness of the material essentially. So the deflection of a twice as big tower or blade is twice as large but obviously so is its length, so its proportional deflection is the same. So stress and deflection both stay the same as length is increased. The mass, however, increases by more than the power as blades get longer. We multiplied our lengths by two and we got four times the power, but 
eight times the mass. There's that square cube law. And the final structural consideration we'll look at is bending from self-weight, which is important for wind turbine blades. On every single rotation, gravity bends the blade one way at the three o'clock position and then back the other way at the nine o'clock position. These are small deflections that cause small stresses compared to operational loads or the bending that occurs during a strong gust of wind. However, bending from self-weight is very important because a blade will bend like that millions of times over its life. And even though it's more than strong enough to withstand that bending load on occasion, after millions of cycles, the blade can break, just like when you bend a paperclip repeatedly back and forth. Bending due to self-weight depends on mass per unit at length according to this formula. And you can see when we double the scale, we quadruple deflection from self-weight. And from a proportional point of view, that's still double as you double the blade length. So bending from self-weight becomes more important of a design consideration as blades get longer. And we do see blade structural designs of longer blades changing to accommodate that. So according to all that, in theory, the mass of wind turbine blades and towers should increase with the cube of blade length, whereas power is only increasing with the square. And whilst the square cube law describes how mass Mass increases relative to power, it's a pretty standard assumption that cost increases roughly in line with mass since the extra mass comes from extra materials and you know you need to buy those materials. But if you look at wind turbine blade mass versus length over the past decades, mass increases have been a lot less than the cubic law. That's because of improvements in blade design and manufacture and, and also some materials improvements like using carbon fiber, which has a better stiffness to weight ratio than fiberglass. Though this is a case where I think that the assumption that lower mass equals lower cost falls over because carbon fiber is a lot more expensive than fiberglass. So you get a lighter but more expensive blade when you use it. So I'm not sure if this trend can continue indefinitely. At some point, blade masses and costs seem likely to revert to the cubic scaling law, although there are definitely still plenty of ideas being trialed to keep it up a little bit longer. A couple of examples of technologies that are being trialed to reduce blade masses include act blade sailcloth design and new internal structures in combination with 3D printing and new materials. But there are other limitations to blade lengths continue to increase forever. As blades get longer, they also get wider, which means they need higher roofs in factories so they can be turned. A 1.5 megawatt turbine has a blade length of about 33 meters and a maximum width of under three meters. If you scale the same blade geometry up to 117 meter blade length for a 15 megawatt turbine, you'd have a maximum width over nine meters. That is a very cumbersome dimension to deal with. You need specially built factories and special turning equipment. So the really big blades that are being manufactured now tend to reduce that dimension somewhat. And there are transport issues. Very long blades can't get around corners easily and large root diameters or wide blades on the edges can't fit under bridges. Segmented blades with some on-site assembly can get around this, but not without a cost and mass penalty. Now let's move on to the tower. Towers are also subject to the square cube law, but there's another major issue that's a bigger obstacle to further increasing tower heights. Modern wind turbine towers are nearly all made of tubular steel sections that are transported to site and then bolted together. That's a really fast way to install a tower, but it causes some design limitations, at least for onshore turbines. Because the steel sections generally need to be transported on roads, their diameter is limited to what can fit on a truck, preferably without needing too many road closures or detours to avoid bridges that they can't fit under. So tower designers aren't free to just make the towers wider and wider as they get taller and taller. If we look back at our strength and stiffness equation, we can see that if the radius is limited, then in order to make taller towers strong and stiff enough, designers need to increase the thickness of the steel. This means you need to use more steel, which adds a lot of cost. Again, there are ways around this. A company called Nabrawind is developing truss tower structures that can be self-assembled in place from smaller sections. 3D printing the bottom part of the tower is another option being trialed, and so is in situ spiral welding of the towers instead of bringing them in in tubular sections. None of these solutions are mainstream yet, but I expect we'll start to see some different tower designs become common in the next decade. The final components we're going to talk about on Team Small is the gearbox. I mentioned earlier that the generator is one of the components I've put in the audience. Its size increases in line with rated power, so a 10 megawatt turbine's generator is about twice the size and twice the cost of a 5 megawatt one. Now, you might have expected that the gearbox would be the same. However, the low speed shaft torque is the relevant factor that determines the gearbox mass, and that increases faster than power as the blade length increases. That's because power equals torque times rotational speed. And a turbine's rotational speed usually decreases as blade length increases. This is to keep the tip speed fairly constant no matter what the turbine size. That's important for several reasons, including aerodynamic efficiency, noise, and leading edge erosion. 
So as rotational speed decreases, torque has to increase, making gearboxes another component whose cost increases faster than power output does. So those are the major features of a wind farm development and how their costs vary with turbine size. In an attempt to keep the video to a manageable length, I've left out a lot of components that have interesting scaling behavior. If you want to dig deeper into that, then I'll put some reports and journal papers in the description. There have been plenty of researchers run complex algorithms to find what the optimal turbine size is. But that optimum obviously changes as technology and constraints change. In my opinion, that's why the size of wind turbines keeps changing. It's not that we couldn't make a bigger wind turbine if we really wanted to. It's that right now with current technologies and current wind farm development and maintenance costs, it would simply cost more to make turbines bigger than they are. At any moment, the optimal turbine size is pretty close to what's available in the market because wind turbine manufacturers are strongly incentivized to come up with the turbine design that gives the overall lowest cost of wind energy. And how will this tug of war play out in the future? To state it very simply, we have structural design factors wanting turbines to stay small and pretty much everything else favoring wind turbines getting bigger. So far, wind turbines are getting bigger, so team big is winning. This is especially true for offshore wind where transport constraints aren't much of a factor because you can build factories right near a port and avoid putting anything big onto trucks. I've been working on wind turbine technologies for over a decade now, so perhaps it's time I gave my own 10 year anniversary cake speech. When I started my PhD research on wind turbine Bone blade structural design back in 2012, I was using a 30 meter reference blade design from a 1.5 megawatt turbine. And I think at that time, the world's longest blades were around 50 meters on three megawatt turbines. The current largest onshore turbine is Vesta's 7.2 megawatt V172. It has 84 meter long blades. And the largest offshore wind turbines are now over 12 megawatts and with blades longer than 108 meters. So in the decade I've been in the industry, blade lengths have more than doubled and power has more than quadrupled. But will they just keep getting bigger forever? By 2032, will we see another doubling of blade length to 220 meters and quadrupling of power to like 50 megawatt turbines? It really doesn't seem likely, but I'm super wary of setting any kind of limit to how much bigger they'll get just purely because I've sat through so many cake speeches where wind energy professionals laughed at their previous predictions. But I actually don't think we'll ever reach the technological limit of how big wind turbines could get. I think we could make a 200 meter or even like a 500 meter long wind turbine blade and put it on an 800 meter tall tower if we wanted to badly enough. But I don't think we'll ever get to the point where that would be a smart use of money or materials. I think the more likely outcome is that we'll find new ways to continue to reduce the cost of wind energy other than simply going bigger and bigger and bigger. These might include new technologies like floating offshore wind, which might be vertical axis wind turbines, might be airborne wind energy or multi-router designs or something else that hasn't even been thought of yet. Big thanks to the Engineering with Rosie Patreon team who support this and every video on the channel. We've got a Patreon only Discord server where we chat about all kinds of things related to the energy transition. If you'd like to join us and help shape the future direction of the channel, you can do so at this link, which I will put in the description. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.